You've survived another week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and supporting the Black Man with a Gun Show. This is episode number 573, and I'm going to answer a question that you may have asked. What is the use of force to a law enforcement officer? What have they been trained? And Michael J. Woodland interviews the owners of JM4 Tactical. I am glad you are here. Blackmanwithagun.com Ken Blanchard's Pro Gun Podcast. Depending on who you talk to, sometimes it seems like we're at war with law enforcement, and it shouldn't be so. Truth be told, I used to be one. I used to train them. Yeah. So I'm going to share a little bit about the use of force continuum. There's quite a few legal definitions and legal speak in there, but it's in my language, so I'm hoping that you understand my mumbles and my stumbles. I want to thank you again for just rolling with me, for being a part of my life and my routine for these 10 plus years. Shout out to all the Patreon.com supporters, folks who didn't think of robbery to share for my time and talent down here in the basement, underneath the washer and the dryer of the Blanchard home. Now, after John Wayne leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm going to try to share something with you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This portion of the show is sponsored by CrossbreedHolsters.com. Crossbreed Holsters has gained national recognition as a maker of the best and most functional concealment holsters available on the market today. Each holster is handcrafted to ensure your firearm is safe and secure while carrying, combined with the best customer service in the industry. Visit CrossbreedHolsters.com. This week, I want to share some knowledge with you, some knowledge about the use of force, about deadly force, about how a police officer has been trained or supposed to be trained, how we should seek to learn. And for the Christians who have always asked this question, what does the Bible say about self-defense? Most of the time when you hear of law enforcement and self-defense, it's for security officers, private security, contract security. They get a few hours of this before they get approved to be on the job. In the class that we take, we take and we teach, there's usually a graph that has different colors. The very first one on this use of force continuum, as it's called, is the officer's presence. No force is used. It's considered the best way to resolve a situation. Supposedly, the mere presence of a law enforcement officer is supposed to deter crime and defuse a situation. That was at least how it's been for centuries. Just recently, it seems like the officer's presence is does nothing if not in flame. Officers' attitudes are supposed to be professional and non-threatening. These two pieces are part of officer presence. The uniform itself is supposed to do something. The colors of the uniform are psychological. The hat that is worn is psychological. Officer presence is more than a uniform. It's how they are dressed, cleanliness, the way they approach, the way they stand, the way they speak. It all matters. The second part of that is verbalization. This force is not physical. Officers issue calm, non-threatening commands such as, let me see identification and your registration. And officers may increase their volume and shorten their commands in an attempt to gain compliance. That's the key. Short commands might include stop or don't move. Next level is the empty hand control. Officers use bodily force to gain control of a situation. This is in two different parts. There's like the soft technique where they grab, hold, use joint locks to restrain. And then there's the hard technique where officer has to punch or kick to restrain an individual. Next level on this continuum of force is less lethal methods. Always is to gain control of the situation so that the person doesn't hurt themselves or anybody else, and especially the officer. 
They have blunt impact weapons officers can use batons or projectiles to immobilize a combative person. And the key word is to immobilize a combative person. There's also chemical means or less lethal. That's when you get the pepper spray and the projectiles embedded with chemicals to restrain an individual. Lately, we have like new electronic stuff, conducted energy devices or CEDs to immobilize. They emit high voltage, low amperage jolt of electricity at a distance. And then finally, there's lethal force. Officers use lethal weapons to gain control of a situation should only be used if a suspect poses a serious threat to the officer or another individual. And officers use deadly weapons such as firearms to stop an individual's actions. There's a couple of important pieces here is that a person does not have to always enter at the same spot or the lowest option on the force continuum, but at the level that would be, quote, reasonable in which to respond to whichever threat they are confronted with. Okay, so we're looking at police officers, those in uniform. And here's the stuff that happens on the other side of the spectrum. From one to six, you have no resistance. You have psychological intimidation. You have verbal noncompliance. You have passive resistance. You have defensive resistance. You have active aggression. And then the criminal or the suspect themselves are using firearms or deadly force. As a rule, an officer may only use the degree of force which is reasonable, necessary to protect him or herself. Here's some stuff that you probably will never hear unless you're actually in a court case. An officer may use only the degree of force necessary to protect another person or property in another person's lawful possession against a forcible offense. An officer, in some instances, uses deadly force to prevent a violent or forcible felony involving danger to life or great bodily harm. When an officer uses force to protect another person, the officer may only use such force as was reasonably apparent that the other person could have lawfully used to protect himself under the circumstances. When using force to effect an arrest, a person must submit peaceably to a lawful arrest but there is no requirement that he submit to an unlawful arrest. The courts have taken the position that a person has the right to resist an awful, an unlawful arrest, believe it or not. An officer, therefore, should do everything possible to ensure that any arrest he or she plans is lawful and that he or she re- proceeds in a lawful manner in making the arrest. When making a lawful arrest, an officer may use only reasonable force to effect the arrest and detention, He or she may not use unreasonable force or subject the arrested person to unjustified violence. One making a lawful arrest may use reasonable force to overcome any resistance or threaten resistance of the person being arrested or detained. They can use force to prevent flight or escape from arrest. Deadly force may be used against a criminal suspect who is attempting to flee or escape when the officer reasonably believes there is a substantial risk that the suspect will cause death or serious bodily harm to the officer or third party if apprehension is delayed. A guard or other law enforcement officer is justified in the reasonable use of force to prevent the escape from a state correctional facility, parish, county, prison, or the physical custody of a guard of other law enforcement officer of a person under arrest, sentence, or awaiting trial. Now, this is just some of the stuff that's mentioned during training of law enforcement and security officers. Now we get to the important part for you and me. The only difference between lawful force for police and civilians is that peace officers are not given the option of fleeing the scene to avoid confrontation. You have the opportunity, a choice, and a chance as a concealed carry holder, firearms owner, not to use your firearm. The law enforcement officer does not. And depending upon the training, the tools, the situation, the timing, all of that, they have a split to second to make a decision. And that's often when we see trouble between law enforcement and other people. Mistakes happen. Death happens. All in a twinkling of an eye. Sometimes we scream for justice and we don't know all that happened, what happened in the courtroom, the facts that came out, the facts that are defendable and provable often don't make the headlines. You wonder why law enforcement get off 
for killing people. This is why. There is always more circumstances than you know, more things that happen on the back end, more things that did not come out in the media. And then the honest part of it is law enforcement, police officers, cops are still people dealing with other people, with family members, with finances, with fatigue, with anger, with issues. Nobody is perfect. So the next time you hear of a case where law enforcement has killed someone, think about all the things I've just mentioned. But you, as a civilian, you have the right to live free in your person. You have the right not to be a victim. If you use your firearm for self-defense, let's ask what actually is a self-defense case. You know, it's fundamentally different from most other criminal prosecutions. The essence of the defense is that the defendant is the victim of an attempted or completed violent felony, such as assault, rape, or homicide, which, but for the defendant's lawful actions, would have resulted in the defendant's death or in serious bodily harm. The complainant is, in fact, a violent aggressor, who, but for the defendant's lawful action, would be the one standing trial. The defendant is the good guy, and the victim is the bad guy, despite the prosecution's efforts to portray the converse. Many assumptions about trial tactics are inverted in a self-defense case. If the defendant presents some evidence on each of the elements of self-defense, then he or she is entitled to a jury instruction on the issue, which places the burden of proof squarely on the prosecutor to disprove self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. If the prosecution fails to disprove self-defense, the client is acquitted. In practice, however, the defense attorney has a great deal of work to do in order to convince the jurors that the client's conduct fell within the common law of self-defense or within applicable state statutes. We like to talk about guns and gun reviews and gadgets and holsters and all that good stuff, but I wanted to give you some stuff that you probably haven't heard anywhere to arm yourself also for knowledge to keep you out of jail. In a couple of weeks past, we've had Andrew Bronca with the law of self-defense. And I'm hoping that primed the pump of your understanding that a self-defense case often requires counsel to understand a moderate amount of technical information about weapons and crime scene reconstruction. Such knowledge is needed in order to, one, review and challenge the prosecutor's experts, and two, understand eyewitness memory issues and how the client the deceased, and the bystander witnesses are affected by the stress of the incident. Okay, you heard me talk about the force of continuum for law enforcement. Let's talk about us, regular folks. In the vast majority of states, the basic elements of a self-defense case means, uh, means what? It means the client had reasonable grounds to believe he or she was in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm. Heated words, vague threats, and the possibility of Future harm are not enough. The harm must be serious and imminent. Secondly, the client actually believes that he or she or a third person was in such imminent danger. Establishing this subjective belief often requires the client to testify. Three, the danger was such that the client could only save himself or herself by the use of deadly force. Some states do not require the defendant to retreat, even if he or she can do so safely. Most states do not require the defendant to retreat if he or she is in his own home, defending against someone who is unlawfully present. Law enforcement officers are not required to retreat. The client had to use no more force than was necessary in all the circumstances of the case. All the circumstances. You can't get no retaliation. You can't get no satisfaction. You can't shoot them because they're sneaking out the back door. You must be in imminent danger of death or serious bodily harm or the prevention of another in your presence. The standards for this use of non-deadly force, using your hands and your feet, the force used in defense of property are usually similar. And finally, at a minimum, the defense must include some evidence and generally viewed in the light most favorable to the defense on each of these factors in order to receive an appropriate jury instruction. Self-defense is all or nothing. In order to establish it, you, hopefully the client, has to admit being at the crime scene with a weapon which he or she used to intentionally harm the aggressor. 
The client has to admit that he injured the aggressor. The client has to convince the jury that if a reasonable person had been standing in his shoes, the reasonable person would have done the same thing. In effect, the aggressor invited his fate by threatening or inflicting serious bodily harm or by threatening to kill the client. That's it, actually. This ain't the movies. Self-defense is all nothing, I said. In one fell swoop, the client, you, has given up the alibi and mistaken identity defense. He or she has given up any claim that the wound was made by accident. Generally, the client must give up provocation, heat of passion or extreme emotional disturbance. Logically, provocation implies an unreasonable response to a situation and mitigates murder to manslaughter. Self-defense implies a rational response to a very dangerous situation and, if successful, results in an acquittal. Also, the client must give up claims of mental illness or insanity and defenses based on intoxication or drug use. It's serious stuff. I was talking to a young person the other day and they said, well, I understand you are the black man with a gun and all that, but um, I don't want to shoot to kill. The Bible doesn't have anything in there about self-defense and the Bible. And I thought, oh, yes, it does. Exodus 22 Uh, Verses 2 and 4 address the killing of self-defense. It says, if a thief is caught while breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltness on his account. But if the sun has risen on him, there will be blood guiltiness on his account. He shall surely make restitution. If he owns nothing, he shall be sold for his theft. If what he stole is actually found alive in his possession, whether an ox or donkey or sheep, he shall pay double. The Mosaic law allows killing a burglar for burglary at night, but not during the daylight. Jesus later addresses in parables the common sense of armed home defense in Luke 11, 21 through 22. So Exodus 22 verses 2 through 4 allows killing a burglar at night, but not by day. Why the distinction? Well, see, killing at night is justified because of the necessity of hand-to-hand combat in the dark with foes of unknown number and weaponry. In addition, the homeowner would fear for women and children in the house if he were overcome or distracted while fighting and outflanked by the burglar's gang. The victim would need to strike quickly and decisively. All these factors make attempts of merely apprehending the intruders extremely dangerous for the homeowner. Yet by daylight, The number of assailants, their whereabouts, and their weapons could be readily ascertained. Neighbors would be awake. As in English common law, the hue and cry could be raised to summon neighbors to help and pursue in daylight. The suspects could easily be identified as they fought or fled, then captured and turned over to the Mosaic judicial system. Daylight made quick escape unlikely since, back then, horses were never, well, they weren't common in Israel at the time. So, in this instance, God allows killing to prevent a night burglary. Burglary is generally defined in modern statutes as breaking into an occupied dwelling with intent to commit a crime therein. A dwelling, in quotes, is a building normally used for lodging, sleeping, or living. Exodus 22.2 allows a burglar to be killed even when his only intent is theft. The text calls him a thief. As in the modern statute, The burglar is broken into a dwelling to commit a crime, yet it's logically logical to assume that at night the homeowner cannot be sure whether the burglar's intent is theft, murder, rape, kidnapping, arson, or another life-threatening act. Common law since Anglo-Saxon times has been held that a man's home is his castle. It's an extension of us not just mere property, therefore, the law traditionally allows deadly force to defend ourselves from burglars. It is a well-known in law enforcement circles that anyone who knowingly breaks into an occupied home is almost certainly there to inflict bodily harm on the occupants, notwithstanding any intent he may have toward their property. During a home invasion, such as described in 22, verse 2 and 7, deadly force is clearly the proper response. The biggest thing I want to talk about in the Bible, though, is the term that was in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. I believe truly that it is thou shalt murder. The difference between murder and killing is a heart issue. 
One is intent. One is who's in charge of it. One is who is behind it. One is government or can be government. The other one is you personally seeking to do harm. Like my friend, when he said, well, I don't want to shoot to kill. Well, I don't want to shoot to kill either. I want to shoot to stop the action. I want to shoot to stop them from harming, shoot them from moving toward me, shoot them from furthering their felonious activity. If they die in the process, then I'm sorry. I just gave you a couple of things to think about. I talked about self-defense and the use of force, the continuum, and especially how it is taught to police officers. And how as civilians, we have a whole different mindset and a whole different legal obligation. And I gave you a brief synopsis of a a time in the Old Testament in the Bible when lethal force was actually approved of. If you have any questions, any comments, I would love to hear them. You can hit me back at blackmanwithagun at gmail.com. After our commercial break, Michael J. Woodland is going to introduce us to JM4 Tactical I think he really likes these guys a lot. Do you like a good cigar? Check out PiroTrader.com. Ever been looking for that rare or hard to find cigar? Or even a cigar at a better price? Tired of searching online at local shops? Or even risking forum pages trying to find your favorite box of cigars? PiroTrader.com is the answer. These guys built the most sophisticated cigar platform in the world just for the cigar community. Puro Trader allows users from all over the world to connect, share, buy, sell, and trade cigars. Connect with thousands of retail shops, cigar collectors, and aficionados from all over the world. This platform is built for the cigar community by the community. So how does it work? It's simple, it's fast, and completely free to sign up. Yes, it's free. They charge a small fee only when a cigar is bought or sold. Join PuroTrader.com now and use the promo code BMWAG for 25% off of the Puro Trader fee. That's P-U-R-O Trader.com and use the promo code BMWAG for 25% off the Puro Trader fee. PuroTrader.com Michael J. Woodland is up next. Thank you, Ken, and welcome to another Tips and Review segment. I am Michael Woodland, and today we are having a discussion with the people at JM4 Tactical. A few months ago, the owner of JM4 Tactical contacted me about their product off a post on my Instagram. It was a good conversation, and four months later, let me introduce you to JM4 Tactical. How y'all doing today, um, Chad and Shalanda? Shondaland. <laughs> I keep butchering the name. I am so sorry. <laughs> you know, sorry. it's kind of funny because every time we go to like the store, um, we got the rewards points when you buy stuff, and, and then they'll sit there and look at the name for a minute and they'll go, Myers, Miss Myers. <laughs> <laughs> I am so sorry that I butchered up your name, but it's like it's it. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing it since day one, so I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but how are y'all actually doing today? Oh, we're doing good. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Since our last conversation, I just want to get you on the show, promote your business, ask a few questions, and actually show people you are a very personable couple that really cares about the community and every regards to gun safety and everything. I I was actually shocked about how easy it is to talk with y'all. Can you actually tell me what is the inspiration with the company, Jam4 Tactical, of course, and how long you've been in business? Well, we've been in business since uh, we actually launched the company physically on the internet, uh, March 2015, March 15th, 2016. Sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. our, our whole aspect of it was to be able to give somebody something, a, a holster to carry when they aren't able to carry. Um, our boys, you know, we have boys in sports. We have four boys. They're always on the go. And one of the main things is, is it's kind of hard to carry, especially here in West Texas. It gets really hot outside, so you're in a lot of gym top clothing. So I'm not saying you can run around with a full-loaded 1911 in your gym shorts, um, but um, – 
it gives us the ability to carry smaller guns. You know, I, I, I carry the shield with my, my gym clothing. Of course, when I go to jeans and pants, I'll, I'll, I'll rotate to the, uh, the uh, Glock 19 or the HK VP. But she carries the Kimber Micro no matter what. <laughs> That's <laughs> <Kimber thing. laughs> Yeah, she loves it. But it, it's just giving people the ability to carry without, you know, without leaving their house or leaving it in their vehicle, things like that. Um, the most important time to have it is on your body, on body carry, not in your vehicle, uh, especially in your trunk, your glove box or in your purse. Even um, it, it's on body carry is our main goal. And we pr- developed the holster for me and her personally. And we thought, well, we've really got something here. So we just tried to do a couple of gun shows to make extra money, you know, because we got four boys and it ended up really lifting and kind of going uphill and selling a lot of them. And we're proud of that because we have a lot of happy customers out there. We're always open to talk to our customers. We're always open to meet people, talk to people, tell them our story. And it, it goes a long ways with customer service also. <laughs> I'm not saying we're the per- perfect company. We've had our issues, but we fix our issues. Um, if we have an upset customer, it's n- not out of the normal for me to pick up a phone and call them, see what's going on. What can we do? You know, what, what's, what, what's, you know, because everybody carries different. Everybody's a little different. But to see how we can accommodate them, you know, and, and uh, you know, whether it's a refund or, or send, you know what I mean, whatever the situation is, we make sure that we, you know, reach out to the customer and we take care of them and we don't leave them. Just hanging out there, you know. Right. Me and Kevin, my buddy Kevin Dixie. Mm-hmm. The night you had called me, the next day I called him, because I was actually shocked. Like <laughs> it actually reached out to me, and we were sitting there. We were just talking like our normal gun talk that we normally talk. And I was more like, "Hey, man, you will not believe what happened to me last night." And he was like, <laughs> "You know what happened?" And I was like, "Well." You know, I bought this holster just to try it out because I've been seeing it online for the past couple of years. And the owner of the company, like, literally called me <laughs> out of the blue. And he was like, are you serious? Yeah. And I went ahead and I told him the story and everything. And then he was just like, man, that's weird <laughs> like that. And, but the more, like, I kept telling him about you, I was like, yo, he is a, re- a very good-hearted person and i like people like that i like to talk and be around people like that and that's why he made the comment to you like yeah mike talks very highly of you (laughs) You (laughs) like i said that literally like blew my mind like just out of the blue i just got a phone call and he was like yeah how you like the product and i was like man we had a a good 30 minute conversation just talking about the product you know so Yeah, that, like, that really blew my mind. So, well, we like reaching out to people. We like talking to people. I'm a very people person. You know, we when we started this company, you know, I've bought in the past and I've had my issues with other holster companies. That I'm not here to down nobody because there are some good holster companies out there, but there are some that are just out there for your bottom dollar. They get your money and then they go away, um, and you never hear from them again, no matter how many times you email them, message them, whatever the case is. And, and that's happened to me before. And, and I've had, you know, Facebook message them and it never gets read. It, never, it just sits there for weeks. But there are a lot of other good holster companies out there that are that are there and, and they, they back their customers then they back their products. And then you have some that don't. We're going to be that company that backs our products. We're going to be that company that back, that helps our customers and that's there for our customers, not just after, you know, when they're buying, but long after they buy also. We're there. For them. Our right. goal when we started this company was actually to raise the bar in customer service and make it more like it used to be where we actually care about our customers and they're not just another member. Which makes sense. And that goes a long way with the products that y'all are putting out. Yeah, oh. we've actually got a review on our, on, we got over 540 something five star reviews, but we've had reviews, you know, in there where they say, you know, I had an issue. Chad called me personally, mm-hmm. you know, and, and got me all squ- squared away. And that, that was good. I've even had a review on me where the product didn't work. He five starred his product didn't work out for me. The owner called me, you know, I got my refund and he suggested another holster company. 
Hmm. That, that could fit my needs. And we've actually got five stars for suggesting other holster companies because I'm not saying we have the perfect holster because everybody carries different. Um, but if you have an issue and you do reach out, we are more than help, more than likely to guide you in the right direction. I've actually had USCCA took an individual two different times to a different holster company said, these are the people you may be looking for. These are may, you're maybe be able to accommodate you better than we do. Mm. And that's, that's part of not just, you know, yes, that individual didn't buy from us, you know, he didn't buy from us, but that's part of our customer service outside of them being our customer. We're, we're there to help. Yeah. That, <laughs> that back end of doing customer service does go a long way and says a lot about the company, but I want to talk about this beast. <laughs> Man, this right here is my new favorite holster. And it literally, since I got it, this is what I do. I literally just hold it and just play with it until I start doing my, you know, my holster drills. And then I sit there in, in one spot and I keep pulling out the holster. So I don't know if you can actually see up in there, like the little rubbing that yeah. I already did from doing my drills. But um, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about this holster and the other products that you have um, with JM4 Tactical? We, we are, okay, when we decided to work on this holster, this holster was meant to solve some issues, kind of like the magnetic one was, you know, it was solving issues of being able to carry comfortably without when you aren't able to carry. You're not having to dress around your gun. You know, you can just dress put your gun on um this one come out and i was told several times when we launched this one this was raised the bar quite high uh we actually have that pad we've got a couple different patents on them on that one right there pending um we took a 15th century method tweaked it and introduced it to the to the 20th century you know method which is a, a polymer um we did not go with kydex uh we went with both wrong. Boltron is a uh, PVC mix. It's it's uh, hot. It, it takes a lot to heat it. Um, it's it's successful. It's uh, temperatures. It lasts in sub degree temperatures. It will not crack. Um, it's not going to just deform in your car. You can't deform it with a hair dryer. Um, any of those type. Of, I mean, those things. That Boltron is built. But then we have the same issue: is a tearing up guns. You know, uh, uh, plastic rubbing plastic against metal slides is eventually going to wear down your gun and they've kind of devalues your gun, especially when you're spending six, $700 on a gun, you kind of don't want to tear it up. I mean, that's like taking a, uh, driving your brand new car through a bunch of trees. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to. So we incorporated and we were able to figure out how to mold it with Boltron and Boltron is a Michigan company. Um, it's everything's made here in the U.S. Unlike some of the other plastics that are that are made overseas, um, Boltron is a Michigan Bay. It's a Michigan company. Um, Herman Oak. We we still have the big deal with Herman Oak. Herman Oak Grade A U.S. Deer hide made right here in the U.S. Tanned right here in the U.S. Um, we incorporated that inside the Boltron, and now you have the easy draw, the quiet draw but you can still put as much retention on the gun and everything is molded together. Everything is, is one. And then we sew it through the Boltron, which uh, no one's ever done, you know, sewing through Boltron and being able to mold it like that and, and be able to do the process that we're doing. But uh, it, it's a beautiful holster. I love them. I mean, and, it, it, it really is a beautiful holster. Like and literally, only time I really pull it out to show people is when they come to my house because um, like if I'm out in public and I'm talking to somebody, I'll talk about it, but I won't show it to them, yeah. you know, but of course, like when people like we're in public, I mean, private, I do pull it out and like, yo, man, you really got to check this out. Tell me what you think. <laughs> you know, <laughs> very beautiful. But like I said, I do have the, the two holsters because I had three at one point um, with this being the third one. I gave one to my buddy. Um, he went and bought a gun and he didn't have a holster. So I gave him that one. Then, um, you sent me the quick, um, I mean the high rise and now this one. So now, um, what I do with the high rise, I keep that one in my vehicle as it's mounted up under my, um, steering column with the magnet. 
And now, of course, I'll just wear this one because I don't take this one off and on like I used to do with the, um, the high rise. Yeah. And I love the high rise. Um, guns.com just, um, uh, they, they, they did a review on three IWB holsters. Um, uh, the high rod actually made number one. And then the uh, new relic, the one that you have there, the, we have a relic series. So we have the, the relic. And like I said, the name for relic come from the 15th century method means old, but it also means uh, reliable, easy, light individual carry holster. Um, but th- that actually made three of the appendix carry, or the tuckable one. And they, they launched that out, what, about three weeks ago? Mm-hmm. Three or four weeks ago, they put that review out. And it, it, it's a great holster. I know it's a little bit on the high-end side of it, but it, it's it's well-made. It's going to last you a long, long time. <laughs> and it, it's not going to devalue, you know, scratch up your gun, tear up your gun, mm-hmm. um, anything like that. But I, I love the holster. I mean, it, I've got my Glock you know, right now with it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so now do, do you think your company actually found the niche in the market and that's going to be around for a long time? Or do you think you're just going to go away from the magnet um, retention or you're going to do more with that as well? No, we're, our, our number one seller is still our magnetic holsters, our flagship product. And of course, that thing has got like, I don't know, 19 different patents on it. Uh, but it is our flagship product. And we still outsell that um, probably 10 to 1. And we do a lot of, of, of orders a day. And that the flagship product is our magnetic because people love it. Um, a lot of individuals buy two of them. They'll buy the high rod and they'll buy the original. Mm-hmm. The original is designed, uh, you know, the roughneck originals, they function the same, just different leather. Um, they buy because it's designed more for that deeper concealment or gym top clothing. It's got the best magnetic retention. That high rod, of course, you know, it's got less magnetic retention, but it gives you your shooter's grip. It's designed for more jeans and belts, things like that. So we actually have a lot of individuals who will buy both. Right. You know, so then they can just swap the holster. Right. And still get the same function. Um, but yeah, we, we sell a lot of them in pairs. Okay. Now, um, can you actually tell the people about the color combinations that you have and how does that affect the leather in any type of way? Well, the blacks, brown, the blacks and browns on the original, the Herman Oak type leather, we uh, hand dye those. Okay. Um, they originally start off tan. And we hand dye them and, and then we put a hot olive oil with a mixture of waxes onto the leather and let it dry. So it takes a few days for actually one holster to, to, to be made. Of course, we make several of them at one time, but it takes one holster to actually be ready to ship a couple of days. Um, the, the, we don't use any chemicals in that that would hurt the gun, anything like that. So the hot olive oil with a mixture of waxes, and we do that on the original, and we also do that on the rough neck. We do that on every leather holster leaves our, our, our shop. It lasts for years. What we're doing is we're remoisting the leather. We're putting the, the uh, oils back into the leather from the dye pro- or from the uh, tanning process. So it, it's good for at least 10 years, you know. Um, the uh, pinks, purples, teals, um, what else color? Pink, purple, teal. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, we, we don't dye those. Um, sorry about that. We, we don't, because of the fact you can't really dye them, um, those kind of colors. So what we have is we actually have to buy that leather um, in, a, in that color. Well, to get leather that color, things like that, it's called chrome salt. And it's a, it's a way, it's a chemical way of tanning the leather and then being able to turn into colors. Okay, well, chrome salt will hurt your gun. So, and, and it will tear the bluing off your gun. So the pinks, purples, and teals, what we do is the outer shell of that is the color. The inner shell is Herman Oak a vegetable tanned leather. So it will never hurt your gun. It's never going to tear up your gun because your gun has no contact with it and we we explain all that my wife carries her kimber in uh the teal one all the time but uh it, it, your gun will never have contact so you still got the prettiness of the holster but the comfort of knowing that your gun is still protected 
from the vegetable tan leather that's interlined with that. But that's the reason they're two tone colors. I got you. I got you. Like I said, it's a very beautiful product. Um, very simple, but like I said, it's very beautiful in um, all respects. Now, here's the big question. All right. At the NRA, y'all had two booths. <laughs> now, I know there had to be some form of a competition between the two booths. <laughs> who does what? So <laughs> you care to share that? <laughs> <laughs> he won <laughs> if there was a competition <laughs> he, he kind of had the better uh better location i think there were a lot of people that couldn't find my booth and we really just didn't have very much traffic over in the area that i was at and he was right by the door dedicated to uber and taxi drop off <laughs> walk in and see his face right there so he uh, <laughs> he took that competition <laughs> That so was a setup. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, she is the one that told me that's my location and I this did. is hers. I did. <laughs> I so, I sure I didn't even get to pick the location. So, <laughs> yeah, I was walking from um, one interview, and then Kevin had another interview. So when we was walking, I was like, "Hey, man, I got to stop right quick." And then that's the first time when I stopped by your booth, you know. And then I was like, "Where's the other booth?" And when you told me, I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna swing over there." And that was. <laughs> end of the day that day so yeah we we, we had a lot of fun addy our junior shooter had a blast mm -hmm. uh, we brought her down and, and of course y'all got to meet her right and she's an awesome little girl she she does really good you know and, and her uncle does a really good job of raising her teaching her to shoot teaching her responsibility of guns and now her little sister is six and she's coming up and he's teaching her to how, how to shoot. Now, she won't be ready for competition shooting, you know, yet. But as soon as she does, she'll be wearing it. Her little sister will be wearing a JM4 jersey also. That's nice. That yeah, is nice. Sponsor her little sister. We've already talked to him about it. We're not pushing. We want them to get ready. We want him to prepare. Um, she's wanting to prepare because she looks up to her, her older sister, Addie. And, and which is a good thing you know she looks up to her older sister and it's tristan right yeah tristan and she uh but yeah she'll be ready i'm thinking probably another year maybe two and whenever she's ready we'll we'll, we'll put a jersey on her and and you know help help them as much as possible we believe in responsible showing your kids to shoot showing them the responsibility of, of the handguns and, and raising them you know to know about them and know that, you know, what they can do and what the danger is. Of them. So, so it's parents' responsibilities. That's it. Yeah. Like I said, when my daughter gets um, around about the age of five or six, that'll be when I start putting the gun in her hand. I'm talking to her now about gun safety and um, she's catching on to it real quick in the little test that I'll be giving her. So she hasn't failed one yet, but when she gets, like I said, five or six, then I'm going to put one in her hand and, like I said, I'm, I want to develop her the same way. Yeah. And, and I, we've talked to our kids about it. We've got a nine-year-old. Of course, he's grown up around guns. Mm -hmm. so, no surprise to anybody. Um, he shot. He, he has shot everything. I mean, he shot his first year at four and a half, five. Um, that was when I was really starting to teach him, you know, um, about guns. And me and him argued over who was going to clean the deer. He wanted to clean it. He was on. He was about five. I was like, no, so you've got to learn. Mm -hmm. And um, but he, he's been out. He, he has shot multiple guns from ARs to the Glock to shields to um, about 410 shotguns. I mean, he, sh he shot it all, but he's learned. And, he, and, uh, and in the process of him learning to shoot, he's learned what those guns are capable of doing. And he's also learned the fact of gun safety and to never touch a gun. And that's one of the things we talked about, you know, and I've talked about with him is gun safety, you know, not just in our house, but outside our home. Because if, you know, I don't teach him and he goes to a kid's house, another friend's house, and he finds a gun over there and he does not know about gun safety then accidents happen, you know, things like that happen, you know, right. and that's why we teach them not just in our home, but to be careful in other people's homes too. That's it right there. Yep. That's it. So how can the people actually get in contact with JM4? You call us at 877-704-5500. Uh, 
5015 and you come straight to this office and somebody will pick up your call of course you go through the push one push two <laughs> but uh the word but somebody in this office here in abilene texas will answer your call you're not being thrown to a answer service somewhere else you're not going somewhere else when you call that 877 number it is coming right here to this office in at abilene texas <coughs> if you email us at, at support at jam uh it comes to this office and somebody will, will answer out of this office it's not going anywhere else um, if you do the messaging on our website, you hit the little green talk button down at the bottom. You're talking to somebody in this office and not somebody somewhere else. You know, you're, you're, everything comes out of this office. and goes through this office. Okay. Um, of course, you're on Instagram at JM4 Tactical. Yes. And Facebook, same thing. Yes. yes. And Pinterest and Twitter. <laughs> okay. Y'all took it a little bit further than me. <laughs> <laughs> all I got is, uh, is always our website at jm4tactical.com. All right. So I do appreciate your time and I'm actually looking out for the next product that y'all come out because I'm pretty sure you're going to do something better than the relic. Um, so <laughs> I'm truly looking forward to the I've next already one. been asking. I, <laughs> when they ask us about what are you coming out with next after the magnetic one, we're like, we have no idea. And then this come about and we worked on this for over about a year. This is this relic's been in the process for a year, which let me remind we have over 430 mold guns. Mm -hmm. So we have a huge list of guns that a lot of other holster companies don't carry. Uh, we don't just carry your most popular guns to right now. I mean, we, we carry stuff from Walters. I mean, we carry we carry it all. I mean, 430 mold guns is a lot. Right. That is that's a whole lot. And, and this has been, like I said, been in the process for a year before we got it launched out. So it's been a, it's been an exciting run. Let me ask you, um, Shondalyn, um, are y'all going to actually do products specifically geared around females? Um, as far as that goes right now, we don't have anything in mind. Um, the magnetic holster, the original was actually designed more for me mm -hmm. because I would not carry because number one, I don't wear belts. I hate belts. Number two, plastic is not comfortable up against my skin. And so the only place I would carry was my purse. And this man right here wanted it out of my purse and on my body. That's it. So that, that was the whole thing with the, uh, the original magnetic because women wear so many different types of clothing. It accommodates almost every type of clothing that a woman can wear. So that, that's our main product that we have geared toward women right now we don't have anything right now in in the works that's devoted just to women but that is definitely a product that women love i'm with you on that so once again um check out the people at jm4 tactical on instagram at jm4 tactical facebook at jm4 tactical and what was the phone number again 877-704-5015. All right. Give them a call. Contact them. Tell them I sent you and you might get something extra. I don't know, but hit them up. <laughs> you know. So once again, thank you all for um coming on to the Black yeah. Men with the Gun podcast. And we let's will be let's get let's give you your uh listeners a uh discount code. Let's do um how about um, MW10? We'll set up MW10. Okay, that's it. MW10. Yeah. Get a discount when you order JM4 Tactical. And that's the number 10. Just MW and then the number 10 all together. No spaces. That's it. I told you JM4 Tactical were good people. I did not set this up. They did this all on their own. <laughs> I do thank y'all too. And um, I'm sure the people will thank you. But at the same time, we will get you back on the show. and um do more conversations with you. All right. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. There you have it. Some good hearted people on a mission to put out some quality product for the everyday shooter. Go check them out at jm4tactical.com. And if you are looking for a new holster, use the discount code MW10 when you check out. For those who are looking to contact me, Visit blackmanwiththegun.com and under the About tab, click on my name, Michael Woodland, and shoot me an email or phone call. 
please leave a voicemail or text message, and I promise I will get back to you. Until next week, keep shooting, keep practicing, and have fun. Back to you, Ken. If you carry a gun for self-defense, be smarter and join the United States Concealed Carry Association so you can be covered in case you have to use the thing to protect your life from the judicial system. Upfront bail bond funding, attorney counseling, personal hardship coverage, membership deals and discounts, firearms theft liability coverage, and more. Go to uscca.blackmanwithagun.com right now. uscca.blackmanwithagun.com Well, all right, it's time to call it quits for this week. Thank you for listening, downloading, and subscribing to the podcast. This is um, working on our 11th year, and I got a big announcement for next week's show. I'm hoping that everything is okay where you are, that you got something out of um, my use of force continuum and talk about the legal stuff, and that you were introduced to a new company called JM4 Tactical um, through Mike. If you follow Michael J. Woodland on Instagram, you may see that he is trying to raise some money for a community project that's very important. Check it out. It's also on Facebook, on our Facebook page. I do believe it's GoFundMe.com forward slash M-W Tactical. Thank you for all the well wishes for Father's Day that I got this week and last week. I thank you guys for even thinking about me, even a little bit. You are truly my friends, and I thank you for being there. Just in case nobody has told you this today, I love you. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Until next week, shalom, baby. Until next time, friends. To keep in touch with Ken and his cause, head over to blackmanwithagun.com. Blanchard.media.